Thank you, Rabbi. You know, it's almost funny how formulaic valedictorian speeches are. I'm supposed to start with a humorous hook or anecdote, and then I look back on high school and I whack sentimental with the move. <laughs> but then I wrap up with thank yous and a look to the future. I finish with a rallying call of carpe diem, and then I sit down, leaving my class to face the wide world with all the confidence, strength, and good advice that I, a 17-year-old with no more experience than they have, can muster in six minutes. Abraham Lincoln once thought so little of what he was about to say publicly that he predicted the world will little note nor long remember what we say here. But the world has done more than remember what he said at Gettysburg. It has treasured that speech. Ask Miss Johnson's ninth graders. But what can I possibly say that anyone here will note or remember? I could just channel the wisdom of those who have more to offer. I could quote Churchill and tell you that a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. Or I could invoke Yoni Netanyahu, who wrote, man does not live forever. He should put the days of his life to best possible use. Both are wise lessons for high school graduates in 2014. But what can I add? Hashem, sefatat yuktah. God, open my lips. I could tell you what I've learned about life from my time at the academy. I could tell you that intellectual and academic freedom are worth taking risks for, that I wrote my senior capstone paper on biblical criticism, and the experience taught me that religion need not be blind to logic. I could turn from intellect to emotion and report that a kind word in passing makes all the difference, that during my senior internship as a car mechanic, the smallest bit of empathy endeared me to customers and employees alike. I can tell you that I could even tell you that the college admissions process prepared me for marriage. Just in time, since Pirkei Avot says 18 is the age one enters the chuppah. Turns out, applying to college is like finding a spouse. After worrying about it for years, you can finally choose the one you propose. And then your beloved tells you she'll get back to you in four months. <laughs> What she doesn't know is you proposed to five others just in case. <laughs> but the truth is, I don't need to tell you anything. I can just stand here, look back on my 13 years in this school, and thank God, my parents, and my teachers for the incredible ride. In just the last four years, our class has grown an immeasurable amount, both inside and outside the classroom. None of us is the same person we were four years ago. We've grown. We've changed. And we have some remarkable accomplishments behind us. We'll be told to look forward that this is a launching point for the rest of our lives. But we can't forget to look back. The chapter in Pirkei Avot that says 18 is the age at which one marries also lists 13 other milestones in life. It begins with the study of scripture at five, and then ends with fading away 100 years old. We, at 17 or 18, have already completed more than a quarter of the milestones. Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch writes that those milestones build on each other. By starting scripture at five and Mishnah at 10, a child is prepared naturally for the addition of logical rigor and debate that happens in the next milestone, the learning of Talmud at the age of 15. Without reviewing those tools, those skills that he's been working on for a decade, a teenager simply won't have the same segue into Talmud. He'll be thrown off schedule, his train of thought derailed. So we have to treasure what we've learned here, even if we can't see its immediate utility. Even if we plan not to pick up a Tanakh or Shakespeare or math book in the foreseeable future, we never really know what lies ahead. The prophet Isaiah recounted God's warning, 
כי לא מחשבותיי מחשבותיכם, ולא דרכיכם דרכי נאום השם. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, declares God. What's beautiful about the Melvin J. Berman Hebrew Academy in particular, and is especially true for our smaller class, is that when we look back on our experience for ways to face the challenges ahead, we find two pools of resources to draw on. We have, of course, the knowledge that's grown here. We've learned scripture at 5 and Mishnah at 10, as Pirkei Avra prescribes, and we've also done Gettysburg at 14 and Faulkner at 17. But beyond the knowledge we've acquired, we have another resource to draw on, a resource that, in many ways, is even more useful. That resource is the MJBHA family. Coca-Cola recently ran an advertising campaign based on trying to get classmates to interact. They installed a fridge full of Coke in a grassy college quad full of incoming freshmen, a group of strangers who were staring down at their phones rather than interacting with each other. But these Coke bottles were far from normal. Each cap was a jigsaw puzzle. Without two matching tops twisted together, you couldn't open either bottle. As freshmen searched for the person with the bottle matching theirs, they interacted. They began to talk, to laugh together. Maybe they even became friends. At the academy, though, there's no need for a Coke-driven campaign to get people to interact. Which is good, since I don't think Coke is allowed by the new health rules. <laughs> We're all part of the larger MJBHA family. And that family breaks down into so many more small, tight-knit groups of people who are there to support us when we fall. Everyone behind me on this stage is part of the family of the class of 2014. But I'm also part of the Mock Child family, and the Model UN family, and the Hadas family. Extracurriculars here are more than a pastime. They can be the focus of your time here, both academically and socially. And if you're not involved in those, you're part of a sports family that is won and lost together, like Ultimate Frisbee. Or maybe one of your classes has become a family. Maybe your European history class bonded over everyone's surprise at what exactly the AP test makers consider history. Or maybe you're in the Kolel, which both elevated my Hebrew to a level where I'd be comfortable learning in an entirely Israeli yeshiva next year, and gave me a family, including the incredible Kolel Bachurim, to help me acclimate to that country. The truth is that the school is so warm and outgoing that you could stand in the hallway, attend zero classes, never initiate a conversation with anyone, and still find yourself part of several close-knit families. Maybe you'd be in Ducks, the door holders union of courteous and kind students. Or maybe you'd find yourself in Lil Wayne Club, which has so often taken over the speakers in the senior lounge. But whatever you decide to do, you'll find people who support you. And as we look back on our time here, I realize that the very knowledge that we have that support, even if the people themselves are spread to far-flung corners of the earth, is enough to push us to motivate us, to keep us going. And that is as valuable as any education. We may not know what's yet to come, but we've been handed the tools to deal with it. Many people have helped us get to that point. I need, of course, to thank everyone here, but I couldn't possibly do that in the six minutes that are slipping through my fingers right now. So I'll mention only a few. I have to offer a heartfelt thanks to all my teachers, who, for all you underclassmen in the audience, really do care about you and would love to see you succeed. I will single out Mr. Rogers, who taught me for three years, longer than any upper school teacher, and in that time managed to turn my sloppy, unfocused writing into something passable enough to get me into college. I also have to thank Rabbi Levitt for meeting out even-handed justice in the halls and in the classrooms. I didn't know a challenge until I took Rabbi Levitt's math class. And he's just as precise and steady an administrator as he's a teacher. The quality is that, in addition to his brilliance, and once you get to know him, his warmth, <laughs> made him an invaluable addition to our school. I have to thank Isaac Saltz for pointing out that Rabbi Levitt does indeed have that warm side. <laughs> and most importantly, I need to thank my family. Yeshli mishpacha shashofechet alai alfa. Mishpacha bemet, kmo trampolina. כל זמן שאני נופל, האח והאחיות וההורים שלי זורקים אותי שוב לאוויר. 
עם משפחתי, אני יכול לגעת השמיים. תודה. I said earlier that לא מחשבותיי מחשבותיך, that we can't predict God's thoughts. But God did leave one clue to the way he thinks. In Yermiah, Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. כי אני ידעתי את המחשבות אשר אנוכי חושב עליכם, נאום השם. For I know the thoughts I think upon you, declares God. And what are those thoughts? מחשבות שלום, ולא לרעה, לתת לכם אחרית ותקווה. Thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to grant you a future and a hope. Maybe Koch had it right all along. The numerical value of acharit v'tikva, a future and a hope, is 1,136, the same as lishtuk, to drink. <laughs> so when those thirsty freshmen bonded on that college quad, they were creating a future and a hope. I'll take it.